I am a distinguished fellow at the Strauss Center for <laughs> International Security Law and an affiliate with the Intelligence Studies Projects, who is your uh, host of the event today. Um, the Strauss Center and ISP are at the very forefront of efforts here at UT to build and grow a program in cybersecurity and cyber policy. Uh, they are the organizations that you students should be involved in if you're interested in uh, cybersecurity and cyber policy, the Strauss Center and ISP. Um, we are um, uh, do, trying to do a variety of things, including bring speakers to campus. In future years, we may have some academic, uh, more academic offerings in this space, uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, this is a guest uh, speaker who's come to speak with us as part of the Brumley Next Generation Fellows Program. So I'm actually going to step off stage and invite Casey Boyles to come up, who is a Brumley Next Generation Fellow, and she's going to introduce our guest speaker today. Casey, uh, she's a master's student in the Middle Eastern Studies Department. So thank you. Thank you. Um, today, I am introducing our guest speaker, uh, J. Michael Daniel. Um, Mr. Daniel is president of the Cyber Threat Alliance, which is a nonprofit that strives to be simply discussing uh, what to do in terms of cyber threat information sharing, but actually start facilitating the cyber threat information sharing among companies and organizations in cybersecurity. Prior to his work with the Cyber Threat Alliance, Mr. Daniel served for over four years as Special Assistant to the President and Cybersecurity Coordinator, or, sorry, yes, Coordinator, yep. um, under President Obama. Um, in this role, he led our nation's cybersecurity strategy and policy. He developed partnerships with private sector, uh, non-governmental organizations, other branches and levels of government, and other nations. Um, before his time as Special Assistant to the President, Mr. Daniel served for over 17 years to the Office of Management and Budget and held the position of Chief of the Intelligence Branch, National Security Division. So in his role, um, Mr. Daniel has worked on projects ranging from shaping intelligence budgets, deterring and dis uh, disrupting malicious cyber activity aimed at the United States, improving our ability to respond to and recover from cyber attacks, and helping to negotiate our cyber commitments with other countries, Russia, China, etc. One of the challenges of cybersecurity policy is that cyber encompasses so many different things. It's about collection, privacy, uh, offense, defense, um, it's reshaping our understanding of rules of warfare. So as we've learned from stories like the Equifax news story, um, single, in single incidents can compromise the sensitive data of over 145 million Americans. Um, just this week, executives from Facebook, Twitter, Google were testifying on the Hill to discuss, the, to discuss Russia's influence in our American elections. So as individuals with Facebook accounts, Snapchat, and uh, UT email accounts operated by Google, all of us could learn something today. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming you today. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Casey. Um, so I've got a couple of slides um, that I'll go through uh, and uh, uh, for the presentation, uh, and then I'll open it up to your questions because that's what's really actually. So, so my. always wins. So that's a stupid game. I don't want to play that game anymore. I want to play a different game. One that we actually have a much better shot at least doing a little talk today about my view of how we got ourselves into this situation and then what are some of the things that we can actually do uh, to change. So now the first question you actually have to ask yourself though is why do I have a job? Okay, why is cybersecurity hard? We were talking at lunch um, about a little bit about this. At one level, when you think about it, it's like, okay, it's, it's computers. It's all ones and zeros. Shouldn't there be a technical solution to this? Shouldn't there be some piece of software that we can buy or a piece of hardware that we can buy that would make this problem go away? And the answer to that is obviously no. But why is that? And I will conjecture for you that there are three reasons for that. 
One is that cybersecurity is not just a technical problem. We tend to treat it as one because it stems from our computers and our phones, but it's really not. Um, it's actually also an economic problem. It's a human psychology problem. It's a national security problem. And all of that sort of all rolled together. One of the first things that I discovered when I came into my White House position, we started um, really delving into things, and this was when some of the big companies started producing their reports. You go and you read the Verizon data breach report, for example. Somewhere north, it's always hard to tell, but you know, with the data, but somewhere north of 80% to 90% of intrusions rely on known fixable vulnerabilities. So, to achieve their success. So what does that mean? That means the bad guys are getting in through a whole out and that we know how to fix. No, like that's not what's happening, but there's clearly some other set of incentive structures. Yes, I'm an old, I'm an office of management and budget guy. I'm an economics guy. I think in terms of incentive structures, right? There's something that's broken in the incentive structure that encourages people to still do things that they know are not right and to not take care of problems. Um, and so that's why I say that it's an economic problem because they're not incentivized to do it right. It's a, it's an, it's a human psychological problem. Um, we keep relying on you know, username and password. And it, we all know that most people choose really dumb passwords. And they reuse the same passwords over and over and over again. And that's human nature. And we're not going to change that. And instead, we need to think about how we encompass that in what we do. So that's one problem that we have. I know that seems like a tautology, but we keep our physical world into And cyberspace is a no network that operates at light speed. And so the concepts of distance and proximity and time is in cyberspace than they do in the real world. Um, and so what's near and far, what's close together, is different. Um, and you can't, um, you also can't stick things in the middle that we used to. Um, so the, we were, again, a word that came up at lunch, disintermediation. So it's a concept that Silicon Valley really likes, Amazon really likes it, it means you're taking out the middle guy, right? Companies directly connecting with their customers. Well, guess what? If the companies can directly connect with you, the bad guys can too. Um, and so the, the intermediaries that we used to have in between are now no longer there. Um, so all of these concepts operate differently than we do in the physical world, but we're still stuck with our physical world analogies and structures. And so we keep trying to apply them to cyberspace and then wondering why they don't seem to be working very well. And the third piece here, which is also most a policy school, The policy structures that we have, our legal um, agreements are still very, very uh, immature um, in this area. And we still are very much struggling um, with how to update and adapt those policy and legal structures for this new, for this new, uh, for this new environment. Um, and it's even down to, you know, the social moors and customs, right? Um, so are we going to decide, I mean, at least for me, I'm very glad that I went to college pre-digital age. Uh, there are no digital photographs of me from college, which is a really good thing. Um, but, you know, from a social, uh, sort of social moray standpoint, is it going to be acceptable employers to look at your social media from when you were 22 years old to make a hiring decision. Um, 
rules around that. We haven't decided those things yet as a society. Bind together. So, um, the strategic context for what we're dealing with, um, it's actually friends or not. And, um, so, in case you were hoping I was going to be some kind of bluebird of happiness, I'm going to dash that right now. The orchids. those physical world analogies and um, and so we put ourselves in is particularly bad. Let's talk about where we sort of stand. You think about the actors that we face in um, in cyberspace, it's a pretty diverse so you have sort of four primary actors that activists. Right, they're the ones that are out for a cause. Um, so this is your anonymous, your groups like that. Some of them do it because they are seeking some sort of, you know, uh, publicity for a cause. Some of them just do it for the lulls. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, whatever the sort of the, the driving factor is behind this. Um, but the good thing about hacktivism standpoint is they're generally, while they, some of them have very sophisticated skills themselves, they lack much of an infrastructure behind them. Difficult for them to uh, sustain operations over time. Um, so they're mostly go after targets of opportunity. They can be annoying, but they're mostly not destructive. Now the terrorists um, have, you know, been successful at using cyberspace to recruit and to get their message out, but they're actually lousy cyber operators sophistication for what they very low um, today. And if some nation state decides it's in their interest to arm this group with a lot of sophisticated cyber weaponry, we could be in real trouble. So far nobody's decided to do that. They, the terrorist organizations have sort of confined themselves to doing things like dock, releasing people's private kind of thing, and going their game. Um, and so there's something that that's actually something that we try to pay a deal of attention to, both when I was in the government and now in my current. Now the the criminal organizations, that's the vast majority. Good. It's a fabulous business, and a the criminal organization. And so, um, when I was in the White House, and people used to ask me, you know, what we were, you know, we were worried about sort of, you know, the 15-year-old hacker. No, the 15-year-old hacker that lives in his mother's basement, or the 30-year-old hacker that's still living in his mother's basement. That's not who we're we're worried about, right? The criminal organizations have made this into big business, and they run it like a business. They've read their Adam Smith, um, and they have, you know, diversified their production lines. They have differentiated their workforce. Um, some of them even run help desks. You can come up if your malware doesn't work. You can call the one eight hundred number, and they'll help you with your malware. I've read the chat logs; they're really incredible. Um, you know, from some of our law enforcement intercepts. It's really quite frightening um, because they act like a help desk, you know. And the, um, and so it's really now operated like a business. So you could call this the industrialization of hacking if you want. And it's really changed the face of how we have to think about what the criminal organizations are doing because this is not, um, this is not low-level stuff. Um, and in some cases, this is very, very sophisticated. 
The last group up there are the nation states, um, and they're in this game to pursue their interests. Um, and that includes stealing information for policy purposes. If you're North Korea, it also includes stealing money to prop up your regime. Um, it means uh, trying to disrupt, dissuade, deter other nations, impose your will um, on other people. Um, but all of them do. Now, there, the capability of the nation states vary wildly. One of the big differences between the nation states and the criminals is that, you know, for the criminals, time is money, right? We're just talking about how they use it as a business, okay? So one of the interesting things is the Poneman Institute did a really interesting study, and they interviewed a whole bunch of like criminal organizations. How they did this, I don't want to know about their research methodology, but the um, but they were interviewing a bunch of the hackers that worked for some of these criminal organizations, and they basically discovered that of course the hackers are not going to spend an infinite amount of time trying to get into your organization, right? At a certain point, they're going to move on. They're going to move on to the next target. It works out to about 100 hours per target more or less, 100 to 120 hours per target, and then they're going to move on. So if you're thinking about defending yourself against a criminal organization, you don't have to keep them out for forever. You have to keep them out for 120 hours. Now with a nation state, that's very different. If they've decided they want to target you because they've got, you've got something that they think they want, they're going to spend as much time as it takes to get there. And they'll keep you. And they'll come at you from different angles and different sides. Um, and also, the more sophisticated ones of them combine cyber capabilities with other intelligence collection capabilities. Um, and that's the ones that are really the most sophisticated. Now, not every nation state is up to that level, um, but there are more and more programs um, by the day. Um, you know, we were in the low 20s that we were tracking um, globally when I was first came into the White House, and by the time I left last January, we were up over 60. So um, the number of programs is, is growing quite rapidly, and I guarantee the number's bigger now than uh, nine months ago. So how do we actually think about the threat? What's happening to the threat, given this set of actors that I'm talking about? And the threat is becoming um, in four is It's becoming broader. And it's becoming broader in two different ways to think about. So one is that we keep hooking all of this stuff up to the internet, right? The so-called internet of things, which we're pretty soon just going to call the internet. Um, now, you know, some of us who've been doing cybersecurity for a while, you know, we thought doing this in a world of wired desktops was hard. Now we've got to do it in a world with your Fitbit, your car, your refrigerator, your coffee maker. Somebody was even telling me that they were at the Consumer Electronics Show recently and they were selling a, a, an internet-connected hairbrush. Now, why in God's name would you need an internet-connected hairbrush? I have no idea, but they sell them. And these are devices that you know, are now going to be part of the fabric of the internet that we're talking about. And we're adding them at an incredible rate. Um, depending on exactly what set of estimates you believe, we're going to have somewhere between 20 and 30 billion devices connected to the internet by 2020. At the pay, that means that we're adding between 5 and 10 million devices per day. So cyberspace is the only domain that I know of that's actually getting bigger on a daily basis, right? There's, on a daily basis, there's not more land. Okay, yes, I know the Chinese are building some islands in the sea, and the, you know, the occasional Emirati builds one in the Gulf, right? But on a daily basis, there's not more land. There's not more air, there's not more water, but on a daily basis, there's five to 10 million more bits of the internet. So we're making our problem hotter. And all this stuff is different. All the desktops for all the differences between Apple and you know, uh, Microsoft systems, they're still a lot more similar than an uh, industrial control system that runs a dam or the stuff that actually powers the internet connected light bulbs. Um, and so we've made this problem a lot bigger and we've made it more heterogeneous. And, um, and so um, the volume that we're dealing with is also going up. Um, so you've got an incredible uh, increase in uh, in the level of activity that makes this problem, you know, more challenging. It's also more dangerous, 
um, actors are increasingly moving to more destructive um, activity. You know, if, if I'd been giving this talk 10 years ago in 2007, we would have been talking about website defacement. I mean, I don't know when the last, when was the last time any of you worried about website defacement, like as a major criminal activity, right? I mean, um, we've moved way beyond that. Now we're talking about stuff like Sony Pictures. What happened to Ukraine and their power grid? Um, that's a much more serious, we're talking about WannaCry and Petya. So these are much more destructive um, sets of, all of the actors have been willing to move up the threat spectrum. And then lastly, it's more disruptive. We're becoming way more digitally dependent. So I'm old enough that, in case you read my bio, that when I started in the federal government in the mid-1990s, if the network went down, we just did something else for the day. Like, you know, we worked on our non-connected computer. We held meetings. We put it with the phone and actually talked to people. Now, if the network goes down, your entire organization is disrupted because probably 75% of your workforce is not even there. Right? If you're a private sector company, they're remote. Um, you know, all of your stuff is stored uh, in the cloud where you now can't access. Um, it's very difficult to communicate. Things that were sort of minor nuisances 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, are now catastrophic for an organization and they're highly disruptive. And it extends all the way up from the personal level through the organizational level to the societal level. So, and it's not just us. I mean, the whole planet is headed in this direction. We are, the United States is still at the vanguard of that, but we're certainly not the only ones. And if you look at nations like Israel, Singapore, Estonia, South Korea, they're in the same boat that we are. Um, and being highly dependent. So we're increasingly vulnerable to, uh, to disruption. And so that's a, so all of this is sort of combining to make for a very, very difficult, uh, very, very difficult environment. And in fact, you're, um, you can now see why, you know, um, given this sort of lay down that I've done, when I was on the NSC, typically uh, the National Security Advisor, she would morning staff and those of us, I would tend to sit on the same side of the table as the person doing counterterrorism, counterweapons of mass destruction, the natural disaster folks, and Susan used to refer to us as the happy side of the table because um, of all the different ways that we could, you know, destroy civilization. So, given this, where, what are some of the things that I expect to see, you know, over the next six to six months to two years? So, the first thing is we're going to start seeing ransomware on Internet of Things devices. So this has been a pretty successful, um, it's been a pretty successful tool for the criminals to use ransomware to lock up business systems and get data. But now we're going to do it differently. Your insulin pump, you want your insulin pump turned back on? Fork over some Bitcoin. Don't want your internet connected car to crash into the median? Pay up. Um, we're going to start seeing ransomware move into the internet of things. Um, and it's going to be a lot more it's going to be a lot more serious and it's going to be a very difficult, um, very difficult thing for us to, uh, to deal with. Um, data corruption attacks. Um, so one of the things that happened with Sony, um, you know, there was a lot of data that was um, with Sony. But there was one thing that the Sony CIO would tell you that actually made that kind of easy because it was kind of easy to see what had been destroyed. Um, you sort of knew what had been taken out. But now think about data corruption. You go in and you flip the second digit of an address in, in random number of address fields. How on earth do you ever get back to known good? Um, that problem for data corruption actually makes data corruption much more threatening to an organization than actual destruction of data. And so we're gonna start to see for people that wanna cause disruption to organizations, it's gonna be a lot more effective to corrupt the destroy it. Collateral damage. Um, we're going to see more of this. We've already started to see it. So during um, Petya, and not Petya, which you know our industry couldn't figure out what the hell we wanted to call it. So Petya, not Petya. Um, the um, we had a one of our member companies was working with a hospital in northeastern United States that had gotten hit by it. And we were trying to figure out why. Because this thing was clearly designed to go after companies doing business with Ukraine, and this hospital system didn't do any business with Ukraine. 
but they did do business with a pharmaceutical company that they had as a trusted partner. And the pharmaceutical company also supplied hospitals in Ukraine. So Petya had wandered across the hospital system in Ukraine, had replicated over to this pharmaceutical company, gone across the pharmaceutical company's network, and landed in North the northeastern part of the United States. They weren't the intended victim of this thing. They were just collateral damage. Um, and we're going to see a lot more of that. But we have no idea how it's an internet. have no idea how this stuff connects together. And it's impos almost impossible to map out um, ahead of time. We're going to see works again, sort of related to the ransomware on the Internet of Things, um, as we become uh, as we to see disruption uh, of that kind of thing. Um, and then machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, we're going to see um, tools emerge where it's used for both the attack and the defense. Now, I happen to be one of those people that thinks this is going to come out in the wash. Um, I think it's going to end up being sort of, you know, we're going to end up using machine learning and AI for the attack, and we're going to use it for the defense, and we're going to end up basically in the same spot where we are right now. Um, it's just going to be, you know, five times as fast. Um, so the, um, but you will see that, and it may cause temporary, uh, temporary shifts in the balance one way or the other um, until we sort of get this all fully, uh, fully played out. So these are some of the things that I expect to happen, um, you know, over the next, you know. Add. Um, there are some constraints, um, and this is where it starts to get interesting. So first of all, of course, Hollywood is not real life. You know, the time that anybody spends at a keyboard in a Hollywood movie is approximately 30 seconds. That easy. It's easy, but it's not that easy. Um, and there are a lot of other things that go on to actually make a lot of these operations successful that you don't see. And so the, um, it there are resource constraints and other things on the adversaries that shape what they do. There is collateral damage uncertainty, and for some of our adversaries, that actually matters. Um, if, you don't, uh, if you don't want to end up attracting a whole lot of attention to yourself, necessarily, um, collateral damage um, might be a bad thing, um, because you might end up attracting some unwanted, uh, some unwanted scrutiny. Um, so, that operates as a constraint. There are capacity limits. The number of people, you know, we talked about, uh, we've talked about the fact that there are not enough cybersecurity professionals um, on the defensive side. Well, guess what? The number of people who could actually write new malware um, and be really creative in that kind of stuff, there are actually a limited number of them too. And so um, the number of people who are actually really good at the bad guy stuff in, um, is limited as well. Um, and then the bad guys all actually have a limited freedom to achieve their goals. This is actually really important. This is where we actually start to have our leverage uh, for the defender side. And we're going to come back and talk about what this means, because it's actually critically important to how we can actually change the game. This part right here. Now, if you're a nation state, you've also got some other problems, um, which is that, uh, one, you've typically probably attached your cyber operations to your intelligence agencies, and your intelligence agencies want to collect stuff. And anytime you do something in cyberspace, you risk the collection. And so the every country that is the intelligence dilemma. So do I take an action and risk my collection, or do I do nothing and still keep doing my collection? So I've got a dilemma, I've got a trade-off, and I'm typically paralyzed um, between the two. Um, the third country conundrum is that the, th the target that you're likely to hit, um, A is not labeled bad guy um, server, um, or just US server, or French server, but is in fact in some third country, um, and you're not quite sure exactly what it is, um, you're not quite sure exactly what all's on it. Um, you, maybe you have access to it periodically, um, but it's in some third country. So now you're going to carry out an operation against another country, but you're going to do it in a third country. Well, wait a minute. Do I really want to do that? What if I get discovered? Does that cause a diplomatic incident? Um, what's the risk on that? And then lastly, the integration requirements. Um, to do cyber operations really, really well, you actually need to combine your 
law enforcement, your intelligence, your military capabilities, along with your defenders. Hard. Those agencies, those elements within a government don't normally like to talk to each other anyway. Um, and so now you're actually forcing them to try to have these conversations. And in many regimes, they actually actively encourage one to spy and, and undermine the other as a means for the regime to maintain control, which sort of undermines the whole collaboration model. Um, and so for many countries, this actually poses a, a and imposes a constraint on how good they can actually get uh, down the road. Um, so these are all constraining factors on, uh, on the bad guys, and it's the points that we actually have to start to leverage um, in, order to, uh, in order to get ahead of the problem. <coughs> so normally, um, so I'm going to talk about actually change the game in a couple of different ways. Now this is actually built, this particular slide that is actually built, I wanted to show it to you because this is what I use with business executives when I talk to them. Um, for what you can do inside your organization to deal with the problem more effectively. And we'll talk about what we can do externally uh, for this, and I'll talk a little bit about what CTA, my current organization, is doing, and then we'll open it up uh, for the questions. But this is the internal set of organizations that you can use to build a better cyber toolbox. And if you look at this, none of this involves buying another blinky box to go on your network. Um, the first thing you actually have to do is change your mindset. This is not a technical problem, not just a technical problem, it's much bigger than that. And as long as, if you're a CEO or a leader of a company or an organization, and you keep relegating cybersecurity to the geek in the closet that you hope you never have to talk to, you're going to continue to fail. If instead you start to think about it as cybersecurity is a business risk manage, and I have to manage it over time. If you're a leader of a public organization, it's a public risk that I'm going to have to manage over time for the country or for the state or a local government. If you start to think about it in those terms, you can actually start to wrap your mind around what it is that you're going to do. You're never going to drive the risk to zero. But that's true in a whole bunch of areas. If you're a business leader, you think about litigation risk, you think about environmental risk, you think about uh, product and brand risk, and none of those can you ever drive all the way to zero, but you manage them. And you drive them down to an acceptable level. And that's what we have to start thinking about doing in cyberspace, and move to cybersecurity more as a risk management problem than a technical problem that we're seeking a solution for. You also have to really start thinking about how you bring in that holistic risk management framework. How do you actually think about this from beginning to end? So for most organizations, they focus very narrowly on how do I build the moat deeper and the wall higher. Um, and that is not going to work. You have to actually manage your risk from not just the risk of somebody crossing the boundary, but do I actually understand what my information assets are? Um, why do I care about them? How do I protect them? How do I detect if I've actually got a bad guy on my network when they actually get in? What am I going to do when they've gotten in? Not if, when they've gotten in. And how am I going to recover from when I've had a bad day? And if you start thinking about it along that entire spectrum, then you actually have a shot at uh, changing uh, the outcomes for your organization. Um, we also, you also need to be developing that incident response plan, uh, that thing here in the middle. Um, because you need to be able to, and again, this incident response plan is not just about you on the keyboard. How are you going to talk to your workforce? How are you going to talk to your customers? If you have a regulator, how are you going to go talk to your regulator about this? Um, my experience in the government when we were dealing with intrusions into the government was we spent about 25% of the time on the technical aspects of what happened and 75% on all of this stuff. Um, the vast majority of our time went into all of that soft stuff around managing the incident and not on actually the technical aspects of what had happened. The now. Again, since you're in a public policy school, and many of you care sort of thing, performance metrics. 
we're terrible at this. We don't have good performance metrics yet in cybersecurity. So if any of you can come up with them, you can. there's a real opportunity. <laughs> um, because trying to figure out how your cybersecurity ness is better than her cybersecurity ness, eh, can't really do it right now. There are some emerging ideas out there. Um, some of them are like, uh, one of them that we focus on a lot is what we call dwell time. So how long does the bad guy get to hang out on your network before you detect them, right? The average right now is well up over 200 days, um, which in cyberspace terms might as well be forever. If I've been on your network for 200 days, I own you. Lock, stock, and barrel. So how do we actually drive dwell time down? Time to respond. In other words, so now you've actually found the bad guy on your network. How long does it take you to drive them off? Um, so there's some others, false positive rates and, and other things. But right now our performance metrics are pretty lousy. Um, so good area for you know to try to come up with better ones in this area. Um, the last thing I'll highlight here is that, and we can talk more about what information sharing actually means in this space, um, but that's continued to, um, and, but we know that we need to be sharing information more robustly than the bad guys do. Um, they share a lot, um, and so we need to stop letting them have a monopoly. Uh, pain in the ass. And so I want to impose those costs on the adversary and make them do the retooling instead of us. 
all the time. Or as I said when I was in the government, I want them having meetings in their equivalent of their sit rooms on Sunday and not me. Um, so that they're having to expend the, uh, the resources in that regard. And then lastly, we need to focus on how we actually start to do better coordination of disruptive actions between the government and the private sector. And that should actually probably be governments now that I think about it, because um, it needs to be plural. Um, how do we actually coordinate and uh, leverage the, the private sector brings to the table along with what uh, governments bring to the table so that we can actually begin to do this on a much more systemic basis. Um, so the last slide I'll leave you with is this is our current set of members for the Cyber Threat Alliance. We're up to 14 um, as of last week. Um, and um, this group is of companies is dedicated to doing those things on the previous slide that I just talked about. How do we actually change the nature of competition in the cybersecurity industry? How do we disrupt the adversaries more effectively? How do we coordinate better with governments, plural? Um, and how do we do this in a way that's, that's different than the way that we've done it um, before? Um, if you know the industry, um, you know that these are pretty fierce competitors. Um, there's not a lot of love lost between some of these companies. And it comes out occasionally in our meetings. Um, but the... Uh, but for the most part, these are all companies that have made an investment to say that we have to do things differently because the way that we've been doing it isn't getting us there. And so um, we could talk more about sort of our model um, behind this, but that's, that's, the, uh, that's the basis of what the Cyber Threat Alliance is trying to do and do it in a different way. So that's my, those are my prepared slides. So what I'd like to do at this point is kind of open it up to your your questions and sort of take this in whatever direction uh, whatever direction you would like to go. So. Sure. So just to your last point to, to go on about the companies that you know probably wouldn't mind one another and have some fail business failure they would see it and to their advantage for their competitors to suffer to try and change that underlying mindset of we have these similar interests in each other's success, if, if at least only yep. in this one area of cyber protection. Is that something that's been difficult? Is that been a problem? Yeah, it, you know, it really, actually, it really actually hasn't because I think at the very senior levels of these organizations, they've realized that they're just never going to be able to be all things to all people. Um, and so that um, they've recognized that in order to compete better, in order for their own products and services to be better, they need the information that other people have. Um, and if you, you know, and it's interesting because the business models for these companies are very different. So how Symantec looks at the world is very different than how Rapid7 looks at the world. Um, and the two sets of data are actually very complementary. And so, um, the all of the CEOs of these companies have made the have made the bet that they're going to be better off by collaborating. Sure. Can you uh, invite Kaspersky to join? <laughs> so the so that's um, and the uh, the applied uh, to be a member, which is what you actually have to do. Um, then we would run them through our membership process the same way that we do um, any other company. Um, and there's a, some criteria that we use, um, one of which is that you have to be able to do business in the United States, you have to be able to be consistent with, your business practices have to be consistent with um, you know, the purposes of, of CTA. So ultimately that would be a decision that would be up to the membership committee and the board, not, you know, not just me. Um, but if they met the criteria, then yes, we would, we would, uh, we would have them in because the, the benefits of the collaboration outweigh some of the costs behind that. Describe uh, many of uh, some of the stress that you've described. And sure. This, uh, the private sector. So if you look at um, the, the basic structure of the strategy that the federal government has been pursuing um, over the last, um, I would really say, um, probably decade or so, um, it really has sort of three components to it. Um, one is um, better defending the existing networks. Um, and so that's both on the, on the public sector and with 
uh, critical infrastructure in the private sector to better defend, you know, private sector networks. Um, and there have been various attempts at. Um, so, for example, one of the clear policy changes that we made when I was uh, in the White House was we instituted a policy that said if the federal government has specific information that a uh, foreign adversary or any kind of adversary is targeting your organization, we're going to come tell you. Um, and we made that the default uh, position. Um, so that we're gonna, we saw it as the federal government's responsibility to do indications and warning, basically, if we actually had information. And I don't mean sort of like, you know, some of the stuff you typically get in intelligence, which is somebody might be thinking about doing something or sometime. Right. No, it has to be a little more specific than that. Um, but that was one of the policy shifts that we made. We've been trying to work towards getting industries to collaborate better together um, and to share um, information. Um, on the international scene, we've tried to uh, promote things like norms of behavior. What are acceptable kinds of behavior in cyberspace? What what should we do and not? Do? What should states do and not do um, in uh, in cyberspace? Um, so that's kind of the the, the first um, set of things. The second thing is that the federal government has been trying to work on developing the capability to better disrupt the adversaries across the board. How do we build up our law enforcement capability? How do we actually um, build attribution capability? How do we put in place the tools in order to impose costs on the bad guys? So for example, one of the tools that um, has been put in place uh, was the ability to impose economic sanctions on malicious cyber actors. Um, and so both, uh, both the Obama and Trump administration have used that tool uh, to impose costs on the adversaries. And then lastly, how do we actually better prepare ourselves to respond when you have a um, So if you have a major cyber incident, how do you actually organize to respond to it? Um, and so the federal government has put in place a, a policy uh, that actually lays out how the federal government is going to coordinate uh, amongst itself. And the, one of the things we're working on at CTA is sort of what's the private sector version of that. So from the cybersecurity industry standpoint, how are we going to try to organize ourselves um, when we have things like WannaCry or not Petya um, that are organized to operate uh, more effectively? Sure. Elaborate on who the criminal majority the United States because oh it's kind of the old Willie you know why do you rock you know so where do you go you go where the machines are um, so um, you know but it's really quite a globally distributed problem and it is a problem for almost any country that becomes connected they immediately see you know this uh, this rise. So you do have, you know, so for example in Africa, so you have Nigeria and Kenya where you have a lot of the sort of like the spam farms and the, you know, that's why you still get the occasional email from the Nigerian prince who really would like for you to help him out, you know, um, or that sort of thing. So, yeah, sure. Back on your previous uh, answer just before this one, you mentioned nation states, incident response, norms of behavior. Earlier this year, the UT Law School had a conference exactly on this, mm -hmm. in which they talked about the efforts on the order of 100 nation states from China, Russia, Europe, Europe, and everything that had developed norms of behavior 
in terms of using concepts like uh, proportional response, yep. or one nation state against another. Has any of that come into practice, and would it provide a framework for this additional work that you were suggesting? So yes, and you can start to see the emergence You know, activities in cyberspace should follow the same general principles that we do in real space in terms of proportional to the to, to the incident. Um, this um, it, it's still a it's still a, a an evolving area um, and one that um, is very difficult to uh, navigate. A lot of countries don't have a lot of expertise in their diplomatic uh, core in this. Um, but I would say those kinds of discussions really are providing the foundation for where we're trying to to go. The um, you know the U.S. has um, endorsed about a set of about ten principles. Um, we we came up with four of our own, and then you know have sort of signed on to you know some additional ones through the UN uh, process. Um, and so you can see the emergence of that. Um, but uh, you know this. It, there's still a lot of uh, disagreement in this area um, as well, um, and there's certain areas where, um, in particular, um, content control um, is really the goal of a lot of countries, and obviously we really don't go in for that sort of thing. So um, that's that to be a, a source. So, for example, whenever our software comes out, it kind of goes into an arms race and for the best. To say, share that with the greater good of people or so forth. Um, human nature being what it is. Um, start provide a, a financial incentive to disclose uh, and to disclose in a responsible manner um, so that you can actually take the time to build the um, to build the uh, the right patch or the right correction to that to that problem. Now the issue is I would say that this also involves like the evolution and I've seen this in multiple industries now it's like they've all got to go through certain stages of grief or something like because most companies first if they've never dealt with like a vulnerability like that their first instinct is to like send the lawyers in <laughs> sorry lawyers you know to be like stop you're you're doing something wrong like exposing this vulnerability and we're gonna slap you with lawsuits if you keep doing it and so then what sell it or they release then, like, then the company gets egg on their face, and so they, they've actually got to figure out that you don't first send in the lawyers, you first send in the engineers to actually understand what. And so there's there's kind of a to develop sort of the procedures and sort of again cultural business norms about how you sort of deal with that to minimize the um, the incentive to that that market, but you're always going to have it, and so. You know, then the question is, on the other end, how can we drive down the value of the, the zero days, right? One of the areas that we, um, that I think we need to actually invest in um, is sort of uh, the, we don't do a very good job in our programming languages right now of sort of um, what I think of as kind of resilience um, and the ability to operate through a degraded environment. And so one of the ways that you can sort of d reduce the value of a zero day is make it uh, the, make the value that's the now. Thank you. So, other, sure. Um, quite a few of us are actually in a cybersecurity um, we were just talking about hackback. So what you were talking about on that last slide, um, sort of the balance between like where our defensive capabilities become a bit too offensive, how the public sector deals with that, but also the private sector. So like where does it go too far? So like I know one of the lines we drew was like beacons. So 
if you can tell where a server is, that's great, but maybe if that you can also like mess with the server, that's a little bit too So like where do you draw that line? So I think the key issues, right, is um, we don't, there's a lot that we don't understand, right? And the problem with Hackback, and a number of my friends in Washington are a little bit more supportive of this concept than I am, um, and we regularly debate this. Um, my contention is that it's a very bad idea for most private sector organizations to engage in much of that activity for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because you actually don't know what it is that you're hitting. Right? Again, we were talking about like they don't tend to use bad guy server, you know, evil dwarf number one. Like not that's just not how they do it, right? And so impacting an innocent third party by your activities and you may also be impacting not only an innocent third party that you kind of know about, but since we don't really understand how all these things fit together, you could also be causing a whole lot of collateral damage that you're not even prepared to, uh, to undertake. Now that, that problem afflicts the, private sector, uh, the public sector as well, but at one level we've invested the government with that, that authority and that capability as a society. Now we could as a society decide that we a private sector company take on some of those responsibilities and therefore also go with the liability that would come with it. And I would suspect you as a general counsel uh, for doing any of the um, because of that liability, but we could go down that, that path if we so chose. What we need to do is to enable a much better, deeper partnership between the government and the private sector in this area um, so that there's more insight on both sides as to what's happening. For me, I always drew the line between um, were you generating any sort of a network? So like a beacon that's simply, hi, I'm here, I've been stolen, that doesn't really do anything, right? Thing that starts to uh, have an impact on that third that third party's network. That's the part that should probably be you know off limits or only done you know under the auspices of the government um, because that just leads you to you know all sorts of other uh, all sorts of other problems. You started out talking about this is a behavioral problem. The incentives are broken, and so I have a kind of two part question on incentives. Uh, first part is. In May, there was an executive order mm -hmm. mandating the use of the NIST framework for yep. the government. Uh, there's also been a, a number of regulations and, and uh, lawsuits suggesting that NIST is the way to go. Do you think that that type of activity will give rise to national or global regulations on what companies have to do, requirements, uh, and so that, that kind of an incentive? And the second part is about incentives from an insurance perspective. Mm -hmm. do you, how do you One of the things that I tell when I talk to them about cybersecurity is I tell them you have when it comes to a standard of care. You can either get together as an, as an industry and decide what you want your standard of care to be or courts to impose it on you. Um, the option of not having one is no longer going to be Is the right standard of care, right? Things like having a risk management framework and consistently applying it start to come in because what you want to be company is to be able to demonstrate that you were taking what a reasonable person would construe as the right sort of cybersecurity steps. Um, the analogy that I do draw here is because th this has actually been an, quite an area of contention. There's a lot of companies that will push back and say, "Why are you punishing the victim?" Um, and my response is, okay, well, there, but there's a difference here. You know, if you were a company and you ran a self-storage unit, self-storage units, and you said, store your stuff with me because it's secure, but you don't have any fences, you don't have any locks, you don't have any cameras, you don't have any lights, somebody breaks in and steals all the stuff. Now, yes, the police might still go after the criminal, but it's probably not unreasonable for your customers to say, hey, the things that a normal business should do to protect my stuff. You're liable for part of that, right? Um, 
And so I think the same thing goes in, in cyberspace. And so that there has to be some minimum set of things that we expect a company to do um, in order to actually say, yes, we've met the standard of care um, for that a reasonable is ooh. in which case, you know, you would at least be you've done the So I think that that's where you're going There is now actually breach insurance. Into that. when there is a breach of a certain size. And so now the actuaries actually start to have data. And they've had data over enough years that they can start to calculate the likelihood and they can also calculate the cost associated with remediating a breach. So now you can offer an insurance policy against that. You have the numbers to do the underwriting. We don't have that in the business operations disruption side. And if you look at the insurance market for business disruption, it's all over the place. The pricing is wildly gyrates from month to month and the policies all exempt everything that you would actually want to protect yourself against, you know, because there's no way to actually write the, there's no way to actually write the underwriting to calculate the risk. Um, and so until we actually start to get some data on business operation disruption over a period of time, um, once we, if we can get that, then, then you know, get, start to form in that area. But until they start to have that data, it'll be very difficult for them to do that. Now, if we actually get to that point, then yes, the insurance companies will start to drive the kinds of behavior that we were talking about, which is like, if you want your policy, then you've got to demonstrate you for it, or if you can demonstrate to us that you have reasonable cyber place, you can pay this much for it. And now you have a way to calculate a return on for implementing cyber um, defenses. But all on actual information. Um, and that's still a hard problem to share because of course most people don't want to actually share it um, if they've been the victim of it. And then of course there's the problem that there's all these people out there that don't even know that they've been a victim of it. Um, so I think we've still got a long way to go before that insurance market really, really emerges. Sure. I and my wife even The, um, um, or I guess the lawyer version would be, it's, f it's, it's fact dependent um, the, um, and case specific. Um, the, but the reality is that um, anytime you are accessing things over an unsecured network, like which probably exists on a cruise ship, that does raise the risk. Um, the, the best things to do are to implement the procedures that your bank probably recommends, which is the two-factor authentication, meaning not just a username and password, but some other kind of <coughs> verification, like through your cell phone um, or things like that. That's the, actually the best way that you can, um, the best way that you can protect yourself. And also making sure that um, you don't leave um, 
like you, you access it uh, through a restricted number of devices so that it's not every device that you have. Um, so that's the that's probably the but that multi-factor authentication that terrible another terrible term that the PR people used to make me swear I would never use in public. Um, that um, the but that's probably the best way uh, to go at it. Sure. How effective generally are the uh, cybersecurity software programs that are available to the public? So the higher profile ones are actually um, they're actually very good. Um, the the issue is that for, so for on a personal basis, you know, um, on a personal basis, most people are pretty, are, are good with the use of any one particular of the products, any of the companies that, you know, are on my list. Now, if you're an enterprise, that's a little bit of a different, if you're a company, that's a little bit of a different problem because you actually have to, one of the things the cybersecurity industry does not do a very good job of for enterprises is actually doing the integration. So, um, meaning that um, if you actually go and you look at most large, in a smaller, medium, anything like bigger than a mom and pop you know, organization, they probably have somewhere between 25 and 40 products that they're using on their networks. And they don't all talk to each other. Um, and so the burden of figuring out how to integrate all that different information that you're getting falls on the organization. And so right now where the cybersecurity industry is not doing a very good job, in my view, is doing is helping, helping people do that integration. Um, I mean, yes, if you've got the skill set, you know, um, to, to do that, great, but most organizations can't really do that. But most of the products are actually, uh, most of the products are actually fairly good. Um, there is actually a company um, here based in Austin um, called NSS Labs, um, and their whole reason for existing is to do testing on um, software, just like that. And they periodically publish reports on the effectiveness of various um, software tools. Um, and um, so there, that's actually an emerging, uh, an emerging industry, and NSS Labs is one of the lead. I mean, there are other, there are a couple of other companies that do that, but they're probably the biggest and best, uh, best known, and they're actually based right here in in Austin, uh, actually up on Mopac. Uh, I always joke that like whenever you go into a company and you start talking to them about, you know, how they have architected their network and they will, and, and they will a lot of times sanctimoniously stand and say, and we've got this network completely separate from the internet. And then you see the engineer who's sitting in the corner going, uh, you mean except for the connection that I use to connect in from home so I don't have to go out in the snow, you know, and like, so yeah, I mean, so I've never found a network that was actually in fact truly segregated. Um, so to my a particularly useful sort of way of thinking about it. Now segmentation, sort of putting bricks in that's critical because um, you don't want to have your network be completely flat where you get into one piece of it and the intruder can just go wherever they want. Um, but actually trying to think about it and saying we're going to, as a defensive mechanism, we're going to assume that our network is segregated. That's a recipe for, that's a recipe for failure. Now, what we can, but what we can do though is we can, you, there are things that you can do where you can say to an organization, do you actually want to connect your operational system, your OT system that runs your power plant or your factory, do you in fact actually want to connect it to your business IT system? Um, really? 
do you really need to do that? Um, or do you want, or how do you want to govern that connection um, and not just allow it to happen organically? And what, you know, and that's, so those are the kinds of questions that, um, that we, you know, uh, that need to be asked and the government role in this is we may decide again as a society we may come back and we say you know what if you public we're going to impose some additional Um, and it's because storage has been so cheap, right? Um, we actually had to go through this exercise in the White House of actually getting everybody to realize where we had all these pools of PII sitting, sitting around. And most of them were on spreadsheets that were, you know, on personal drives in computers. Um, and sort of starting to enforce the policy of no, those are going to be stored centrally in certain locations and not anywhere else. Businesses are starting to realize, though, that, like, so it, I will tell you as a cybersecurity professional that the have, because I it, right? So the, um, so actually thinking through, and this is where I actually say that, for example, privacy and cybersecurity are actually mutually reinforcing. It's actually pretty obvious how cyber, good cybersecurity reinforces privacy, right, in a digital age, but the reverse is also true. If you have good privacy policies, if you understand why you collect the information that you do, and, you, and a good privacy policy, what else does it tell you? It tells you to figure out how long you're going to keep that data, and then what you're gonna, how you're going to get rid of it, right? You have a data retention policy. And so it actually reinforces your cybersecurity because you're not strewing this PII all over your network. Instead, you're actually figuring out how you're going to you know, main, collect, maintain, store, and get rid of that information. And so a good privacy policy actually is really uh, a very good reinforcer to better cybersecurity because you're actually thinking about how you're managing that, that information. Um, and so I think that more and more companies are starting to realize that there's a big, there's now a cost um, associated with retaining information that you don't really need. Um, and there's much more of a focus on actually going through and doing the business case for why you're keeping that that information. So, sure. And then speaking to the kind of overarching human component that you talked about earlier in the lunch, you mentioned things be getting more sophisticated about the information they can find online and sorting through that. Um, while it doesn't necessarily directly translate to what they're actually putting themselves online and out there, you know, to be um, taken advantage of. Where do you, do you think there's a disconnect there or and how would you explain that? Yeah, so I think that the, you know, some of it is, I mean, there's various aspects of the, the psychology of it. Um, in, you know, I mean, I would see this in the, in the White House even, like when I would go around and I would talk to the, so um, when I would go around and I would talk to some of the people about needing to uh, change how we did some of the business and the, and the response I would often get is, 
oh, I'm just so-and-so's assistant. Nobody's interested in me. And I'd be like, oh, friend. <laughs> They are very interested in you. You work in the White House. You know, but there's kind of this mindset of, I can't possibly be a target, right? Um, and the, um, and in fact, actually, because you're so-and-so's assistant, they're actually more interested in you because you actually know more than the principal does. Um, so the, um, so, you know, changing that mindset and getting people to think in those terms is very, um, is very challenging. I think that some of this, again, is this is still so it's such a new area that we just don't understand how all of uh, how all of it is going to ripple through, um, and we just don't have the right, even the right language to talk about it, um, of what those digital footprints and the digital evidence actually look like. And it seems so ephemeral, right? I mean, it's so it's on your machine. It, comes and goes very quickly, but yet it seems to stay around for forever. We don't really have anything like that in the physical world. Um, and so I think that all of this is going to require some different, some different ways of talking about it and um, you know, different social norms having to emerge. And so this is a, still a new, it's a new area, and it's one that I don't really have a good answer to. Um, and it's one that we talk a lot about. Um, from you know all the member companies that I have, you know we talk about sort of how you get users to do various things and not do other things, and there's a lot of there's a lot of issues with that. So, appreciate sure. it. Uh, and it, yep. um, th thank you so much for your time, and uh, we appreciate you being here. Yep, absolutely. Thank you.